Welcome back, Darklings. How are you? If you're joining me again, thank you so much. And if you're new here, consider subscribing. We talk about some interesting stuff on this channel. Today, to continue some of our docu-series on the greatest minds, we have John D. Just to give you a bit of variety in between the Norse stuff we're doing. So I hope you enjoy and much love. John D. He was a great mind ahead of his time in the 15th century, known in legacy as a mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, teacher, writer, occultist, alchemist, and a hermetic philosopher. Born July 13, 1527, in Tower Ward of London by his mother, Joanna, the daughter of William Wilde, gave him his Welsh roots. His father, Roland, was a mercer and gentleman courtier to Henry VIII. John Dee claimed to be a descendant from Rhodri the Great, Prince of Wales. His family arrived in London with Henry Tudor's coronation as Henry VIII. From 1535 to 1542, Dee attended Chelmsford Chantry School, now called King Edward VI Grammar School. Dee entered St. John's College in Cambridge in November of 1542 at the age of 15, graduating with a BA. With his abilities recognized, he became an original fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge on its foundation by Henry VIII. Dee then began to travel Europe, meeting other great minds, such as cartographers Gerardus, Mercator, and Abraham, or Tilius. He learnt through mathematicians such as Federico Commandino from Italy. He returned to England with great knowledge in mathematics and astronomy and astro astronomical instruments. In 1552, he investigated alongside with Girolamo Cardano from London a perpetual motion machine and gems with magical properties. Dee was offered a readership at Oxford University in 1553 but declined, more focused on philosophy and science, and began his writing. In 1555, Dee joined Worshipful Company of Mercers as his father did. That same year, John Dee would be arrested for calculating because he had cast horoscopes of Queen Mary and Princess Elizabeth. The charges were raised to treason against Mary. Dee appeared in Star Chamber or English Court that sat at the Royal Palace of Westminster from the 15th century to mid-17th century. Dee exonerated himself but was turned over to the Catholic Bishop Bonner, whose role was to persecute heretics. For his examination, his lifelong secrecy may have worsened the matters and said to have had a dramatic episode of attacks and slanders against John Dee and continued throughout his life. Clearing his name again, Dee became closer to Bishop Bonner. In 1556, Dee presented Queen Mary with a plan for preserving old books, manuscripts, and records, and founded a national library, but his idea was not taken up. So instead, Dee built his personal library in Mortlake, acquiring books, manuscripts, and other things in England and on the continent. Dee's library, a center of learning outside the universities, became the greatest in England and attracted many scholars. The Monus Hieroglyphica is an esoteric symbol invented by John Dee and also the title of the book he wrote about the meaning of the symbol in 1564. This embodied Dee's vision of unity of the cosmos and is composed of various esoteric astrology symbols. We'll come back to his writing soon. 
When Elizabeth succeeded the throne in 1558, Dee became her astrological and scientific advisor, even choosing her coronation date. From 1550s to the 1570s, he served as an advisor to England's voyages of discovery, providing technical aid in navigation and political support to create a British empire. John Dee was the first to use the term British Empire. In October 1574, Dee wrote to William Cecil I, Baron of Burghley. Seeking patronage, William Cecil was the chief advisor of Queen Elizabeth I. In his writing, Dee claimed to have occult knowledge of treasure in the Welsh marches and valuable manuscripts kept in Wigmore Castle, knowing that the Lord's ancestors came from that area. In 1577, Dee published general and rare memorials to the perfect art of navigation. Back to the Monus Hieroglyphica, a Kabbalistic interpretation of the glyph he designed, meant to express mystical unity of the cosmos and creation. His work was esteemed by many names of note, but today the glyph cannot be truly interpreted because nobody has the secret oral tradition of that era pertaining to the glyph, but many have speculated and it's interesting to speculate and study. In 1570, he published Mathematical Preface, arguing the importance of mathematics as an influence on arts and science. This was his most influential published work and most reprinted to this day. Later life, around 1580, Dee grew weary with his progress in the secrets of nature and diminishing influence in the court circles. He wanted calendar revision, colonial establishments, and his voyages of North America ended his hopes for political patronage. This resulted in an energetic turn towards the supernatural as a means to acquire knowledge. He began contacting spirits, scrying, and work with angels. D.K. became convinced of the benefits of spirituality through his work with Kelly and began hearing angels tell him several books to write, some in an angelic language or Enochian language. It's also said that Kelly assisted him in hearing these angels' voices and languages because of his mediumship or abilities. Edward Kelly was a spirit medium and worked alongside with Dee together writing this language and channeling the information revealed to them by the angels, said to still be an Enochian magic practice to this day. Dee says the last person before he and Kelly to know the angelic language was Enoch himself. In 1583, Dee and Kelly started a nomadic lifestyle in Central Europe, meanwhile continuing their spiritual work. By 1587, Dee was becoming a renowned alchemist, but so was Kelly, and Kelly became more sought after by royal families and such. Dee was more interested in communicating with angels to solve the mysteries of the heavens through mathematics, optics, astrology, science, and navigation. Dee returned to England in 1589, while Kelly went on to be the alchemist to the Emperor Rudolf II. Dee's Final Years Now at 60, Dee returned to Mortlake after six years abroad to find his home vandalized, his library ruined, and many of his prized books and instruments stolen. Furthermore, he found increasing criticism of occult practices which made England less hospitable for him and his magical practices and philosophies. He sought out Queen Elizabeth's support, and in 1595 she finally appointed John D. Warden of Christ's College in Manchester. This College of Priests had been re-established as a Protestant institution by Royal Charter in 1578. However, he could not exert much control over its fellows who despise or cheated him. 
He was consulted on the demonic possessions of seven children by these priests, but took little interest in the case, although he allowed them involved to consult his still extensive library. Dee left Manchester in 1605 to return to London, remaining warden until his death. By that time, Elizabeth was dead, and James I gave him no support. Dee spent his final years in poverty at Mortlake, forced to sell his possessions to support himself and his daughter Catherine, who took care of him until his death in Mortlake in 1608 at aged 81. His parish registries and gravestone are missing, so in 2013 a plaque was put on the south wall of the present church in his honor. Other interesting facts I want to include for John Dee is his spouse, who was Catherine Constable and Jane Fromond, and his children named Michael, Theodore, Arthur, Roland, Medina, or Medina, Francis, Margaret, and Catherine. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I probably could have uh, made this extremely long. John Dee was an extraordinary mind and did some extraordinary things. I love his ideas. A lot I take special interest in this Enochian keys or this angelic language that he was able to establish along with a lot of his uh, astrology ideas or astronomy ideas. Um, I encourage anybody who is interested to read his books or research him a bit. He's a really interesting character.